Okay, so now we're into part three where we start the actual building of Linux from scratch. And this used to be in two chapters or two parts, as I remember. Um, slightly different to what it is now, where we build a cross tool chain and temperature tools, but it's all, all one part now. But it's two slightly different things that we're doing. Or very different things actually. So let's go on to important preliminary material and this tries to explain what um, is happening, how it's being built. Um, and it says here the important this is where the real work of building a new system begins. Be very careful to follow the instructions exactly and it is important don't try to change things if you're not sure what you're doing do copy and paste carefully um i know in the past i've been copying and pasting quickly you miss the beginning of the command or the last character or last line in the command um and it can although the command might succeed uh there's obviously not enough in the command for it to complete correctly as it's intended and as it says you should try to understand what each command does um, don't just copy and paste like I'll be doing. I'm doing it purely for the purpose of showing on the video. Um, but if you are learning, then uh, try and interpret each command. I've, I've always said that the best way to learn Linux from scratch is to type the commands in by hand um, rather than copying and pasting because it forces you to slow down, read the command, and by typing it in, your fixing that command into your head a little bit more um, obviously this is going to be more error prone but if you take your time um, it is possible to build a system in that way I've, the first time I built Linux from scratch was by hand and I was lucky to have a running system first time um, and I have actually since built it once or twice uh, manually like that tedious though it is um, and I have to say Linux from scratch is probably the big driver in how I learned Linux from scratch through the commands that are in the book. Uh, it gave me an idea of um, the type of commands, how they're, uh, uh, how they're constructed and so on. So yeah, if you are keen to learn, take your time and if you can, put the commands in by hand. Also stuff there about reading documentation. Um, and it says about using the T command if you want to redirect the output uh, to help with debugging. Toolchain technical notes and information here about how the cross compiler works. Um, I'll quickly go into this. I've, I have done a video on cross compiling and how it works. Um, I'm not so sure it's particularly appropriate to this so much. Um, it's based on something called a Canadian cross. If I get another tab up and put it alongside this, uh, if you go to the wiki page about cr uh, Canadian cross, it's got quite a nice little diagram there at the moment, which augments what the information is that they've got here. Oh, Canadian Red Cross is not the one. It's let's put compilation as well. Right, yes, this image here. Um, basically, ignore ignore the different architectures and the different operating systems because this is the only difference really with the Canadian Cross and what Linux from scratch is doing in that we're compiling at all times with the same architecture. So that's why it's not a true cross compile. Um, a true cross compile, the name's in the clue, you're cross compiling across different architectures. Um, and with the Canadian cross, what you're effectively doing, you start off with the native compiler. So this GCC here is native to Windows and you use that to create another compiler that can generate that um, bi binary for that architecture. And we use that compiler 
to create binaries uh, or sorry another compiler that will create binaries for this third architecture and these three stages are the stages that are listed in this table here so in the first instance we use the compiler on machine a to build a compiler that can build binaries for machine B. So that's what this target B is here. Then we use the host, uh, sorry, then we use uh, this compiler here, which is the build machine, if you like, to um, build a cross compiler using this compiler, sorry, to produce this compiler using this compiler but it's on this machine um, and then finally using this compiler which we run on this machine we create the final binaries as we needed um, it's kind of hard to explain when you know in a quick way um, in this instance when it's I'm not specifically talking about this, this, these videos are not about this, they're about Linux from scratch, but um, just take it from me that you need these three stages to do a, a true uh, Canadian cross. And because it divorces the initial compiler, the initial environment, the initial architecture from the final one, that's why it's so useful for Linux from scratch. But just bear in mind that all these, these two stages here are occurring in the original machine. Um, as far as architecture is concerned. So, for example, we're building with 64-bit um, x86. Oh, these two boxes would be here, and this box would be under this machine here, um, all within the same one. That's uh, kind of a quick, quick explanation of uh, how the Canadian Cross works and it's it's all to do with making sure that what we produce for LFS has no reliance on this on the host machine i.e. in our case it has no reliance whatsoever on Gen 2 or any of Gen 2's packages that's what what this is all about uh, some more information about the triplets and how they're used and manipulated to help with the cross compile um, and then there's some other information here about um, the targets and so on. Um, as again, as I say, I recommend you read the book first <clears throat> if you've never done LFS and certainly read it again, even maybe while you're waiting for stuff to compile to get a true understanding of how how it's done. It's it's on the face of it, it looks really complicated, but once you've read it, um, it's not too hard to understand what is happening and why it's done that way. General compilation instructions. Okay, so we're for the final time before we start compiling, make sure we've got LFS set, we have. And it says to, you know, double check that these things are set. <clears throat> well, we've already checked them, but it may be worth going back and checking these things. We've done the host system requirements, so I'm happy that these are set because we, we have checked that. And then it describes here what is going to happen with each package. And you'll see me do this every time and it gets a bit routine, but that's good in the way because it needs to be a routine. You need to do these every time. You need to, well, we've already extracted or placed the patches and sources into one directory, which is the sources directory. So let's change there now. Oops. Uh, trying to type one handed and it's not working. Okay, so there, if we list that, there's all the packages and the packages, uh, patches, um, as well as the other uh, super, uh, supervisory files that we use to download them. Uh, so change into it, so we've done that. And then for each package, we extract the package, we change into the directory that has been created from extracting the package. We follow the instructions in the book. Then we go back to the sources directory and then we click uh, clear, i.e. we delete the extracted sources unless we're told otherwise. 
reason why we delete the packages straight away after we finish them is because some packages get rebuilt several times and you don't want to start with a package that's been tainted basically it's got stuff left over from the previous build you want to start afresh every single time even if something goes wrong rather than risk carrying on if you fix something carrying on don't reuse the sources come back to the source directory delete what you've done re-extract and then start the compilation process over again uh, it's far safer safer and you're less likely to introduce errors um, which may not appear till later on so here we go we're going to now start with the first package uh, just a little introduction here it says we're going to use uh, cross compilation and it does in fact say it is faked um, so as I say it's not a true Canadian cross compilation in that the architectures are the same all the way through it's the technique that's uh, the key thing, the technique is a Canadian cross um, that's being followed. And it says that the programs compiled in this chapter was installed under the LFS tools directory to keep them separate from the files in the following chapters. And they are temporary, they will be deleted at some point. So let's go on and we start with the first package, which is bin utils. So we do tar. You can do minus X on its own, but I like to do V to see that things are happening. And uh, bin utils, why isn't that tabbing? Oh, F, yeah. Sorry, so it should be tar minus X, F, and then the name of the file, or X, V, F to see what's going on. And bin utils. So that's extracted bin utils. So now we change into that directory that's been created there, bin utils 2.40. And we can start now. We're in that directory with the instructions. And you'll see this is the one SBU. So if you time this, you'll find out roughly how long the other packages will take to build. So the first thing to do is to create a temporary directory for building, change into it, and then build it. So as it suggests here, you can time everything to get an idea of what one SBU is. So I'm going to do that. And what we do is stack these commands together with the double ampersand so that they all run successfully. They'll all complete. If one of these commands fails, it will stop there dead. It won't carry on with the subsequent commands. So this is the configure running at the moment, and now it will be running the make. Okay, so that's taken 24 seconds. So one SBU for me is 24 seconds and again like i said it's a rough guide uh, another thing i've just thought of is if you've got a modern alder lake or rocket lake cpu with um, asymmetrical cores that's another place where the sbus are gonna vary somewhat you might get certain tasks um, put onto the efficiency cores and obviously those tasks are going to take a little bit longer than if they were on a performance core. So that's another thing to bear in mind. I bet if I run this again, I'd get a different reading. It might be 25, it might be 23 seconds. But, you know, that's, you know, splitting hairs really just for a matter of a few seconds. So roughly one SBU for me is approximately half a minute. So that's all been built and installed into the uh, temporary tools. You can see there. It's installed it there. In fact, we can uh, look at that. And you can see there's the first few directories that Bin Utils has created and installed some of its stuff to. So now we need to go back to the sources directory and completely delete the Bin Utils 
directory. Ensure you are deleting directory and not the source file, which occasionally I do um, if I'm in a hurry or not concentrating. It can be quite annoying to have to go and fetch and download the package again. So that's bin utils done. We move on to the next package. Uh, one thing that's worth noting is that although there's a link at the top of the page to move on to the next package, um, always find it safer to scroll down and use the link at the bottom of the page. And this ensures that you haven't missed any commands at the bottom of the page. Um, for example, if you'd got down to this far and you click the link here, you might miss the fact there's some more commands or optional commands or more information that's at the bottom of the page. So I would avoid using the links at the top of the page when you're moving forwards onto the next package. Okay, GCC, so let's extract it again as we did before with bin utils. Uh, XVF GCC. So this is quite a big pack. In fact, it's the biggest package that gets compiled. Um, unfortunately, it needs to be compiled three times, and the third time is certainly the longest, but it's just one of those things. It's critical. Obviously, it's a compiler, it's absolutely critical to everything else that goes on. So again, we've extracted the package, we've changed into the directory, so now we can start installing or running the commands that are in the book. So first one is that tar command, rename something there, and we'll just carry on. Again, you could copy and paste this all in one go. If you've not done Linux from scratch before, or you're a bit new to Linux itself, do one at a time and just ensure that there's no errors or if there's a message just read it and make sure it's what you'd expect. For 64-bit hosts or in fact just run this if you're on 64-bit or 32-bit if it's 32-bit it will skip it. Um, it doesn't matter. Now we're going to and that is basically one command in that that needs to be right there, pasted in one go. Now again, we're going to create a temporary directory and we configure the package and that's done. Let's just see how long this is likely to take. So approximately two minutes on this machine. It's four, sorry, 3.3 .3 SBUs. So yeah, about, yeah, about two minutes, two, one and a half, two minutes, it reckons to compile this which would include the configure and the make install, but they're going to be negligible. So I'm going to time just to make this time. See how long it takes, but yeah, just a minute or so. A minute or two.
Okay, so that has finished. It's taken just over two minutes. So now we can install it. <clears throat> that command there. And there's some information here about this command, this next command about some headers. So we'll just put this in and run it. And that's it. So that's GCC completed for this part. And we'll move on now to Linux API headers. So once again, extract <clears throat> the package. Oh, sorry, change into it. And now we can start running the commands in from the book. So we clean the source directory, run this make target, delete some of the headers and then we copy them into the place where we want them and that's complete okay now we move on to glibc which is the GNU C library so again we extract and change into the directory and then we can follow the instructions in the book and it says create a symbolic link for lsb compliance and create a symbolic link so again you can run this command on 32-bit or 64-bit and it will behave as appropriate it'll do what it needs to do um, even if it doesn't do anything for your particular architecture which looks like it does do two different things <clears throat> It's always advisable to put the commands in. They would have been written to behave correctly, depending on what architecture you are using. And we've got a patch to run in. Okay. GLibc documentation recommends building GLibc in a dedicated build directory. So we'll create the directory and change into it. <clears throat> and ensure that ldconfig and sln utilities are installed into user bin prepare it for compilation and then we run the make so again let's just see because these ones are a little bit longer we will just see how long these take so it's one and a half sbu so again it's going to be approximately a minute minute and a half maybe Okay, so that's 40 seconds that's taken that time. Uh, now this is the bit where it does say it's vitally important to make sure LFS is set. <clears throat> so let's echo it because what will happen here, we're going to install glibc and if LFS is not set, it will overwrite the host system's glibc and that will just completely trash your, your system. It just well, it will stop running. Um, and you definitely will not be able to boot into it again. So we've double checked it, it is set. We can run this confidently knowing that we're not going to overwrite the host. Um, uh, more to the point, yeah, I forgot, it's, it's not, it wouldn't do it uh, as we're LFS, but if you were root, if you ignore, ignore the messages uh, to 
um, not be root when you're doing this part and that's uh, again another reason why we set up LFS and um, it could cause all sorts of problems so that's installed fix a hard-coded part of the executable loader in the LDD script so let's do that then it says at this point it's imperative to stop and ensure that the basic functions which are compiling and linking of the new tool chain are working as expected to perform the sanity check run the following commands so let's run this command and this command here and it says as everything's working correctly there should be no errors in the output the last command will be of the form requesting programming interpreter lib64 ld linux x8664.so2 which it which is. and if you're on 32 bit then it'll be slightly different it will be that output there and clean up the test file so that's glibc done um, building the packages in the next chapter will serve as an additional check. If some package, especially bin utils, pass to or GCC pass to fails to build, is an indication something's gone wrong with the preceding bin utils, GCC or glibs and C instructions. So that's good. And as I said before, I thought this was this has been finished, but by scrolling down, I can see there's one more command to run. So you can see how important it is to get to the bottom of the page and use the link at the bottom of the page. So we run this utility and that's it, there's no output and we now can tidy up and move on to lib standard C++. Right, so this is part of the GCC sources so we need to extract GCC again. change into it and then we follow the instructions to build just the lib standard C++ part of GCC. So that's configuring the build. <clears throat> and we actually build the library now. and install it and then remove some libtool archive files because they're harmful to the cross compilation so this is quite important and that's done it you can see there it's removed them so that's that first part done we've created a cross tool chain now so we can we've got a compiler that can cross compile so the next bit is we're going to compile some additional tools to support what we've just done. And before we carry on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the state of the system, create a snapshot in case I need to come back to this point, and then resume. So you can see the VM's taking a little bit longer to save now because memory's been allocated, there's more on the disk and so on. Okay, so let's right click that, take a snapshot and I'll put in completed cross uh, let's put the chapter number in. Cross the tool chain. So that'll do. So you can see we're building up a history of checkpoints, if you like, where if something goes wrong, we can go back to that point, redo stuff. Um, and you know maybe potentially end up with a a build that works correctly. And if it didn't, we could go back further and maybe try from there and so on. So I'll carry on now with the current state, and we can carry on building. 